And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Suzanne Giesman, spiritual teacher, best-selling author, and messenger of hope who guides people to the certainty that love never dies and that we are part of a multi-dimensional universe. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I just love sharing the messages of hope with people. Well, Suzanne, I know you come from a military background and it's a massive transition from that to where you are now. But I'm curious if there are any elements from that background that still are intertwined with what you're doing today. Oh, definitely. And it's funny you say that, Jeff, because I just did a, me- a meditation a couple of days ago asking my guides, show me anything I need to heal. And they took me back to this, why I have this recurring nightmare about being out of uniform and in the wrong place. As an aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's like the last thing you want. And I keep having that nightmare. And so they took me back and and showed me that I don't need to completely give up the commander persona because it does still help. Uh, Right off the bat, one of the things that, two things that come to mind are the discipline to prioritize and get things done and do them on time because I have a lot of balls I'm juggling all the time with with this work. And the other is the, the, the discipline to maintain my physical fitness because when I communicate with those in spirit, that's a lot of energy pumping through me. And when I give workshops to large groups, that's a big physical drain. And so because I established that military routine of working out daily, I carry that forward today and and just seem to accomplish a lot more. So I, I see the benefit in that background, but there are also parts of parts of it that I definitely need to set aside, the rigidness, et cetera. Well, you're still in a position of leadership. It's just that you're not in going into battle unless you want to consider it spiritual battle these days, helping people overcome their fears and their anxieties. Yeah, I try to stay away from words like fight and battle and, and just embrace the wholeness of mm-hmm. life. But the leadership aspect, I, I, I'm grateful for the background I had. I got to be a commanding officer, and I was tough back then. I, I, I didn't know any of these spiritual things. And I, I may have told this publicly before, but I'm not ashamed of it now. My my uh, staff called me old iron britches. <laughs> not many people know that, but I had to be tough in this job where, where I was responsible for taking those who were not obeying the Navy's rules and kicking them out. So I got a lot of people who were not following the rules. And I often wonder how I would handle things today knowing what I do about spirit, knowing who we are, I would certainly be a different kind of leader. That's for sure. Did you have a religious background growing up? None at all. My parents made it clear that they didn't even want to talk about religion. I didn't know why it was taboo for them. So I just picked up uh, basic religious understanding, the Judeo-Christian understanding, at least, from just interacting with my friends at school. So would it be fair to say that during that career, you would be at the minimal skeptical of all this stuff? Of the paranormal, was I skeptical? I was open-minded. I was interested and intrigued, but skeptical. So there's a difference between open-minded skepticism and closed-minded. I was always open-minded. I was fascinated at concepts that I was picking up here and there and even dabbled in astral projection while I was in the military. Wow. I didn't tell my colleagues about it. (laughs) (laughs) Would you say that there was this piece of you that was missing during your career, the spiritual aspect of you, a oh. hole with inside of you? Oh, hugely, huge. And I tried to fill it with food. I was, I was, at, my first book was, is called Conquer Your Cravings. Because for years I struggled with emotional overeating and had no idea why that was. I know what, what it was now. It's, all of us find some way of filling that emptiness and and I, on my homepage, I say, now I take people from an emptiness that can't be filled to a fullness that can't be contained. Because once you really realize who we are as souls in human form, it just, 
I, I like to say it spews out all over everyone. I mentioned to you before that there are a lot of people out there that are suffering and grieving yes. over the loss of their loved ones and family members and friends. Can you just say with certainty that life continues after death? I take you beyond certainty to a guarantee that life continues beyond death. The, the evidence from not just others, but my personal experience is, is overwhelming that there is a greater reality. But I don't want people to take my word for it. I like to show people how to get your own evidence, but it's out there. Your show interrupt, interviewing hundreds of near-death experiencers, that alone could convince people. But I add to that my personal experience, the, the way those in spirit come through with creativity, cleverness, meaningful messages at just the right time shows me we're not just dealing with data and, and history in the in the, some field somewhere, this real-time interaction with sentient people who just happen to no longer be in a body. Was there one event that was the catalyst that made you go from believing to knowing? On a personal level, it was when my stepdaughter, Susan, who had passed, came to me and talked in my ear and in response to me saying, Prove to me this is you. I know it's you, but I need to convince your dad this is you. Tell me something going on with your biological mother that I couldn't know. And she gave me three things that were validated. That was my first real personal experience. But even at that point, I was just starting to study mediumship. And I had been told, oh, never say you can prove that mediumship is real because the skeptics will eat you alive. And I took that to, to heart until... I had this one experience with a young man across the veil whose nickname was Wolf. I wrote all about him in an entire book called Wolf's Message. But that young man left absolute proof. He gives me goosebumps every time I think about it, that, this, that we are souls and that the soul knows certain things that just may not filter up to our human awareness. This Anybody who reads his story uh, would have a hard time giving any explanation other than that when they hear the evidence that he left. A lot of my work is when people cross over and they're there temporarily and come back, but you have more access to people that are there. <laughs> what yeah. are they doing on the other side? That's my most popular YouTube video. That's what people <laughs> want to know, Jeff. It really is. <laughs> and I had the hardest time with that question because I can validate the presence of someone in the spirit world when they they show me what kind of work they did, how they died, all kinds of evidence that I couldn't know, and uh, things you wouldn't find on Google, you know, things that only their family members would know. But how am I going to validate if they tell me I'm visiting this library with every book in the world and, you know, I can't myself believe that there's an actual library with books until I have that experience. However, when they come through from across the veil and they tell me what they're doing and it lines up with an interest that they had while they were here that I don't know about, then I'm inclined to say they probably are doing that across the veil. Like the man who came through and said, I'm golfing every day and standing firmly on two feet. And his wife said, oh, how wonderful for him because golf was his passion, but he had his leg amputated before he died. So now he's standing on two feet. And of course, it's it's not physical feet, but he's created a body for himself so that he can get a hole in one anytime he wants. A lot of times we talk about higher selves and what we are here is a filtered version of that. Do you ever connect with somebody's higher self, even though they're physically here on the planet? Yeah, this is such a setup from spirit, Jeff. We did not discuss the questions you were going to ask. Right. but. It happened to me this morning in the reading I did today. Cool. I was connecting with, and, and it just does not happen too often. And usually when it does, and just probably 10 times or fewer in all my readings has this happened. But usually it's somebody who has dementia and wants to let their loved one know, hey, I'm fine here. My higher self is fine. But this was, this woman said, that's my dad you're talking about. And he has nearly died several times. He's 95 and he's 
he's about to cross. And I said, well, let's see why I'm talking to his higher self. And he just had several messages and he was explaining why he's hanging on so long. And it was just, it's still curious to me why his higher self wanted to talk in the reading. Her mom also came through. She has crossed to the other side and she was very evidential, lots of apologies, which is a big reason why people often come through. But that really surprised me. Are they living with so much guilt? I'm assuming if they keep apologizing from the other side. Oh, see, that's a human thing to call it living with guilt. This is just a cleansing process just to make those apologies and to say it because they know it will help us heal. They, they get surrounded by love. We all are all the time, but we get across the veil and it's suddenly just, just your eyes are open. You say, oh my God, it's always been about love. I missed some opportunities while I was back there. I can't wait to let them know it's all about love. And it's so it's not this weighing guilt like we feel on the human side. It's more a let me make my apologies to lighten their load. And then it also, of course, clears that out of their pattern, but it's really not the same as what we go through here. Do you ever think about that we come here for a purpose or to learn certain things, but the puzzle is we come here not remembering that? Oh, I think about it daily. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know but how I... we can discover our purpose? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a new book coming out from Hay House uh, early next year, and it's called The Awakened Way. And it's, I make it very clear in there that so many people say, we come here to learn our lessons. This is true, but it's not like, oh, you, you, <laughs> like, like that's a bad thing. Like we're not good enough, so we have to learn lessons. I like to liken this reality to creative school, like art school, cooking school, music school. You come here already with these gifts and talents. How can we develop those even more? How can we learn to express our light, shine our light even more beautifully? And so we do that through connecting. It doesn't necessarily have to be with other people. But through relationships, that can just be with nature, with animals, with people. Why does that feel so good? Because that's our purpose, to come to see ourselves as interdependent parts of the whole. And so when we become very insular and, and only think about our own problems, we suffer even more. When we open ourselves up in service to others, even if it's just, hey, how are you today? We feel better. Well, that's the natural nudge of the soul that says, this is your purpose. Awaken to who you are through connecting with others. And in so doing, you help them. So it's just this self-perpetuating, ever ongoing evolution of the light inside. The recent theme we've been talking about is that free will is an illusion or at least partly an illusion, because if you get off track, your higher self will guide you back to what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, I don't feel that free will is an illusion at all. I feel that free will is part of the process, but it is just a part because you're absolutely right. I've been shown recently and really been working this every day with my guides. You're not here to guide me. You're here to flow with me. So I kind of picture one on each side of me and I take a step and am I flowing in a good direction? Let's keep going. And so I'm making my choices. <laughs> I just heard, or so you think. So you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a certain point at which we are guided because we're asking and we're open to that, to what's going to be best for all concerned. So when you learn to, to, to make choices and trust that maybe they're coming from higher consciousness, and that's okay, then who cares about free will? Just flow. Well, being a person of the military, I think you're a fan, if not a big fan, of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> and big one of, time. <laughs> and one of yours is N-O-E. What does that stand for? Oh, yeah. I like to joke that that people, you, you interview people who have had NDEs, right. and I've had an STE, several spiritually transformative experiences. I, 
I've tried having an OBE, an out-of-body experience, but every day I look for NOEs, and that is no other explanation moments. And that's like, oh my God, there, there is no other explanation than that we are part of a greater reality. We are not only human. That's the first principle of living the awakened way, acknowledging we are not only human. I'm, I'm looking at one NOE right here. You want to hear it? What sure. it was? Yeah. I had been in meditation and I know now that angels are real. That's another popular video. You know, angels are real. One that I did. People love angels, but you can imagine with that military background and a lot of people listening now, very left brain. Oh, come on, angels. That's just airy fairy stuff. I know they're real now, yet I was reading a book that said there's so much more around than we know. We're here. There are millions of us and we're around you all the time. And we're just like unoccupied <laughs> we angels. We need we need more to do. We need more of you to ask us to help. And I sat in meditation and I said, all right, I want to believe this. If I'm supposed to believe this, what sign are you going to give me? And they popped in my mind, Eureka. I said, all right, I cannot think of the last time I saw or heard the word Eureka. So I'm just going to file that in back, of my, back of my mind. But for a good sign, it needs to come within 24 to 72 hours. Two days later, we got a big package in the mail, something we bought on our summer trip. It was all packaged up and we're unfolding it. It's a piece of artwork. And the sculptor sent a magazine article with it describing his work. He had stuffed one of his flyers in the magazine at the exact page where his article was. And this is the article. Oh, it has a giant word. I mean, four inch high letters. Eureka is the title of the magazine. That is an NOE moment. And I know how spirit works. That at the angelic level, the guide level, they knew that's already in the mail. And so can't you just see sitting back metaphorically and uh, up above, rubbing their hands together and say, oh, this is going to be good. Wait till she opens that magazine. And we have this moment of shared joy. And my trust grows even more. And somebody else may say, oh, that's a coincidence. And I say, well, God bless you. I hope you have your own NOEs because it's fun. It's mind expanding. And it just shows we're on purpose. You know, it's interesting is I feel like I'm at the beginning of that where things are starting to come to me now and I'm just going to go with it and trust that this is real. Trust and flow. I'm writing another book because I have it coming out in October called it's mediumship, part of the sacred stories series. And I just today finished writing the two sections on trusting spirit and flowing with however they show up in your life. So you better buckle your seatbelt, Jeff. Well, do you think that everybody's getting these signs from spirit all the time and they're just ignoring them and probably when they cross over, they're going to go, oh my gosh, I can't believe all, all these signs were there for me. It's not quite like that because I know my husband doesn't get these signs all the time. It's when we're open to them that, and then we start to get excited about that. It has a magnetic uh, state, magnetic sense to it that it starts attracting more and more because it builds its own field of excitement and there then magnetizes these kinds of things to you. And that's why I get them daily in OEs. And so that's why I say buckle your seatbelt, Jeff, because if you're now, now you're showing, I'm open to this. I'm acknowledging that maybe even I can have this happen. So everybody listening, hopefully will say, Hey, angels, <laughs> I'm open <laughs> to this. My loved ones across the veil, especially those who are grieving. You know, I know I'm grieving, but I'm open. I'm ready. I'll be watching. Knock my socks off. Right? Are you clairaudient, by the way? Is that how your communication comes through? I have all the clairs. Yeah, a clairaudient, lots of clear hearing. In that case, hearing the word Eureka. But clairvoyant means clear seeing. I don't see the spirit's faces normally, if at all. But I see sign. I see images, pictures, objects, places. Uh, Claire sentient. I feel their personality. I feel their presence. I feel their symptoms. This morning, I was thinking, oh, I need to call a chiropractor because I'm getting this pain in my neck when I go like this. And then my client came on and I said, oh, no, 
getting this pain in my neck. And then all of a sudden her, all her symptoms started coming out and she had a major problem in her, in the cervical spine, right at the very top. And, it, and I realized, oh, it's not me, it's her. So I get these sensations that belong to people in my field, their sentience. And then the, the highest of the clairs is claircognizance. You just know things. Yeah. Are you at the level now where they're coming so often that you have to shut it down? My guides took care of that for me from the very beginning. They knew me, you know, they're, they're like, she's going to do her duty. She's going to deliver every message she can. She'll never turn it off unless we do. And they are absolutely right. I, I just, when I meet people and I hear they have someone who passed, right away, I want to tune into their loved one immediately. And I don't, and it's frustrating. And it's because I would just burn myself out. But when spirit nudges me and says, you, you really need to do reading for that person. We set the time and could not be more happy with the results. In your opinion, is everything and everybody right here, they're just on a different channel, like changing your television set? Are you reading over my shoulder when I was writing today? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is an NOE happening it, in real time. It may be because really, I just finished writing the section about when we when we connect with spirit, it is very much like you pick up the remote control, you push the button on that remote control, and you trust that it's going to the intended channel. You don't have to know how the remote control works. When we understand that the signals of every reality are interpenetrating our own reality right here, and our mind is the remote control, our intention pushes the button, and we say, shift. I want to go to the level where I'll meet my client's mother or whatever. Or I want to go to the angelic realm in meditation. Shift. Here we are. It's not some separate compartmented area. It is a different channel, just like you said. Earlier, you said the words awakened way. And I believe that's your essential message. Can you tell it us is. how that came into being? Yeah, it's even, it is the title of this upcoming book, The Awakened Way. And what's important is the subtitle, Making the Shift to a Divinely Guided Life. Every one of us can learn to do this. And that essential message came from that young man named Wolf, who I talked about earlier. That's why the book's called Wolf's Message, because he came back so clearly in a way that was tested at the University of Arizona, that Dr. Gary Schwartz. The, the way he came back was put through a rigorous test to verify this was real spirit communication. But he came back to tell all of us we're out of alignment with our true nature as a species. Read the headlines if you doubt that, right? And he showed us in his message, you know, how to get back in alignment. And that I distilled it down to three really key points. The one I've already shared that we are not only human. So what are we? Wolf's way of passing shows us we are souls also right here, right now, not just when we pass. The second one is you're part of one big web connecting all that is. And people read that book and they start to see the web. So it serves as kind of, I hate to use the word portal because that sounds very new agey, but it really opens people, the energy in the book and the awareness in the story to starting to have their own NOEs. I get emails all the time. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing wolves all the time and this is happening and that's happening. And then the third principle though is that this creative healing force that is uniting us, that's causing the web to become apparent that allows us to know we're not only human is love. And this, that may sound Pollyanna, but love is not like, I love you, human love. It's just this total knowing that we are all connected, right? When you fall in love with someone, what is it? What is it that you feel with them? We are one. I love you so much. <laughs> Everything. You see nothing but connection. Well, at the spirit level, that's why they talk about unconditional love. It doesn't matter. We just know that total lack of separation is what binds us. We can get all scientific and call that consciousness. Or we can get spiritual and call that love. Same thing. It's a force. Before the podcast, I mentioned that even though I've done so many NDEs, there's still new information coming. And 
talking about this interconnectedness, I just wanted to share this with you and get your thoughts on this. This man during his NDE was with his soul family doing his life review. But the fascinating thing was everybody in his soul family was also experiencing his life review. At, at, while here on physical earth? No, in, during his NDE. Oh, they were with him. But they were there. But I, I've never heard anybody say that they went ahead and experienced all his life as well. And that mm. kind of gives me the point when people talk about, you know, maybe we're all one and and then we bring our experiences back and then everybody else can share our experiences. Well, why have experience if not for growth, right? You have narrated six Hemi Sync recordings. Did you do that with the Monroe Institute? I did. And I have to tell you how that evolved. Scott Taylor is a, a, um, a friend and colleague who had his own Hemi Sync recordings. He said, Suzanne, this would be really good for you to do with your mediumship uh, focus. And he said, what you do is you come up with a, a script for a guided meditation. You send it to the people at the Hemisync company. They'll edit it. They'll send it back. You make some tweaks. You send it back. You go back and forth till they agree upon it. You go to the recording studio and they put beautiful music with it. They insert the binaural beats to bring you to a coherent whole brain state. And you have this beautiful recording. I said, okay, well, Jeff, I have learned that you know, if I work hard enough, I can come up with a nice script, but why go to all that effort when I have this beautiful team of guides named Sanaya who give me daily messages. So I just got into a nice expanded state. Beforehand, I turned on my tape recorder. My intention was, guides, we need the first in the series of mediumship training CDs for Hemisync. Please help me with that. And... This meditation just came out of my mouth. I turned off the recorder. I transcribed it. I sent it to the Hemisync company, and they did not change a single word. Wow. They accepted it off the bat, and we've done six of those, four for the mediumship series and two for the getting to know your true nature series. And they have never edited a single word because it didn't come from me. It's channeled, and you can people feel it. It's beautiful. Are your books the same way, channeled? Somewhat. That's totally a really cooperative engagement, as channeling is. I have to I have to be there and allow the words to come through. But I was really hitting a block the other day with this book on mediumship that I'm writing. I, the enthusiasm wasn't there. It wasn't flowing. So I just left it alone for a few days. And then I was awakened at three in the morning. And suddenly I started to get little bits and pieces that I rolled over and wrote down in, in the dark on, on the paper I always keep by my bed. I got up in the morning and it all just started coming together. And I was like, oh, you didn't like the direction I was going. So, you, <laughs> you know, you, so if something isn't flowing for anybody, just just ask for more help, wait. And it's just so apparent when you're being guided. While you were with Scott or involved with the Monroe Institute, did you ever take part in their gateway program? I took the whole gateway program and it's fantastic. In fact, it was by listening to the Gateway Program on recordings in 2008 that I really started to open up to mediumship. And, but that was my goal. It wasn't the goal of the Gateway Program, but that, those binaural beats and the focus. And that's why today when I teach courses with the Shift Network, I am actually now, you can't really require students to buy the Hemisync and use the recordings, but I say, if you want to get the most out of it, get at least one of my mediums of Hemisync recordings because it's those binaural beats and the commitment to a practice of expanded awareness and deep meditation that makes all the difference in, in mediumship. And I ended up going back to the Monroe Institute and being one of their teachers and residents, uh, uh, guest teachers, uh, for probably six six times I did that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I noticed that you were at the Arthur Finley College in London. Did you ever consider being a teacher there? I didn't because that is run by the Spiritualist National Union, and they have their own requirements. And I just felt in my heart that that was not my path. I'm more of a, a free agent. I've, I've never liked being put in any box. It's not negative. I don't mean it negatively, but when you you know, you know, I'm a card-carrying 
person of this religion or that belief or that form, that to me feels boxed in from somebody who spent 20 years in the military. So I just like to flow with how my guides guide me. I love what they teach at Arthur Finley College. I mean, that was foundational for me, but not my path. Well, while working with the Hemi Sync, were you able to have an OBE? I never had what Robert Monroe describes as feeling out of your body, looking down on your body, rolling out of your body, wandering around in somebody else's house. Never had that. But I feel that when the, the, all awareness of the body disappears and you're in such an expanded state that now you're having adventures in consciousness in that regard, out of body experience. But it's it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you are traveling in a spirit body somewhere. What are your thoughts on dreams? Are they meaningful? I am not a dream expert. I can only speak to my personal experience that when I have these recurring dreams, like I just mentioned earlier, I'll take that into meditation and say, this is coming up for a reason. My guides, will you show me what I need to learn from this? Then there are those other dreams that are so solid and so uplifting, you know that's a visit from a loved one when that loved one's in it. Those are beautiful. Mm -hmm. They don't just disappear. Well, you know, In the morning, I'll wake up and I'll say to my husband, and I dream all the time, and I'll say, oh, I just had this disturbing dream, but I can't remember it. I can't tell you what was happening except bits and pieces. That's just your subconscious chewing on stuff that's floating around in the field. We get to another acronym. What are the three E's? The three E's. That, those are the, the three E's of living the awakened way. How to live a consciously connected, divinely guided life. And it, we were talking about it beforehand. It comes up because what you're doing with your show and interviewing hundreds of NDE people is providing people the first E. Educate yourself about the greater reality. Learn all you can about what the current understanding of consciousness is and what is the afterlife like, because that opens yourself to having those kinds of experience yourself. So educate yourself. If you don't believe something's possible, it's less likely you'll have that experience. And that is the second E experience the greater reality for yourself, experience your connection with higher consciousness yourself. How do you do that? Through practices such as my Bless Me Method, the Sip of the Divine, meditation, binaural beats. Open yourself to having your own experience of higher consciousness. And the third E is don't just sit there and say, wow, what was that? Who is that? Wondering. Engage. That's the third E. Engage any experience you have, dive right in and say, who are you? And now listen, have a conversation with what you sense or who you sense. Ask, engage guides, even if you don't see them, don't really know that they're there. Say, all right, if you're really here, what sign are you going to give me? And something pops in your head and then you have a eureka moment. Mm -hmm. So educate, experience and engage, but it's not linear. It's just whatever you're guided intuitively to do next. Well, I think I'll go read this article. I think I will go watch Jeff's podcast. And now maybe I'll sit and meditate and have an experience or you know, maybe I'll just ask, what is it I need to know now and engage? So it's just a, a flow. To follow up on the second E, I had a guest recently that's a PhD psychologist that's researching on how to be psychic. And he said, with his, I guess with his findings, that if you don't believe you can be psychic, you won't be because your brain is a filter. I don't know if I can absolutely concretely say that in every person's case, but absolutely. I just wrote that in, in the mediumship book that Henry Ford is the one that said, if you think you can, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. <laughs> I love that. That's great. I was looking at your YouTube channel and it's very successful. And one of your videos on there is asking, is Archangel Michael real? Can you tell us about that? Oh, it was hard enough for me to admit that we have spirit guides, but my guides pulled out all the stops and 
I had multiple NOEs with spirit guides. But then our angels real, and then you can watch the video. Our angels real, absolutely. But these archangels, you know, I, I was I'm a tough nut to crack because you have to give me the evidence. And one morning I was trying a new technique to to expand my field and fine tune it like an antenna. And in the process of fine tuning my field like an antenna, all of a sudden this presence stepped into my awareness and it was so powerful, so much stronger than anything that I had felt to that point. So I engaged. I'm in meditation, but I silently said, who are you? And the voice said, Archangel Michael. And Jeff, my reply was, oh no. <laughs> it really was because I just thought, no, I'm really going to be asked to believe this. So I said, well, how can you prove this to me? How can you show me? I don't know the archangels. So which one are you? And he holds up this sword and a shield. And he says, I come to all those who fight for freedom and stand for love. So there's that word fight that I don't even like, but it came from him. And I said, all right. And then he grabbed me and whisked me off in, on this adventure to show me about how consciousness works. And uh, he ended the whole visit with this cryptic message, Hebrews, and something else. I can't even remember at the point, but I wrote it all down as I'm, I've learned to write spirits messages and maintain that expanded state of awareness. And the video explains all of it. But one hour later, my husband and I decided to stop and hike a trail we weren't even supposed to be on. And we come across two people speaking Hebrew. And her name was Michael, <laughs> which is Michael. And he had given me a lesson in coherence. He said, this is really the key to making a co connection is coherence by using an antenna. And both of these Hebrew speaking people, strangers on a trail, were scientists skeptical of my work. We had a conversation. Both of them worked with studying coherence and radars. It was off the charts, inexplicable, other than that somehow I was guided to that moment to those people. And uh, it's really interesting because the, the verse of Hebrews that I looked for when I was trying to say, well, maybe he was giving me a Bible verse. So I looked up Hebrews online. Uh, the verse that he, I was given was all about when you meet strangers who have a message for you, you know, this is a gift. And that was definitely the gift there. I have no doubt that he is real. And in fact, has he comes to me not regularly, but often enough that I recognize him. I have another good one to share with you. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was doing a reading at the request of Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona. He he often will call me. Or he did it more in the past. And he says, Suzanne, I need you to do a research reading for me. I can't tell you anything. Just do it. And I say, yes, sir. I'll do it. And so this man came in person to my house. And he's a, he was pretty big wig. He has his own or, uh, spiritual organization, but I didn't know anything about him. And I'm tuning in to do a mediumship reading and fumbling and feeling awkward because I'm not sensing anybody and, and his parents, if they were there, they were very, very unclear. I was not doing well. And I thought, oh, this is not going to look well for Dr. Schwartz. It's not going well for this man. And I said, I'm sorry, what did you hope to get out of this session? And he said, um, well, Dr. Schwartz and I may collaborate on some work and I wanted him to know that he can trust me. And I said, oh, well, you don't really need a mediumship reading then. You need a, more of a, a guide's comments on you. And he said, that would be nice. So I tune in and here's Archangel Michael, which just didn't happen in readings. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he's going to think I'm one of these, you know, crazy new age people, which I am. <laughs> but uh, I said, well, there's a person here who's saying this and that about you. And he said, who is that that's speaking? And I said, well, it's Archangel Michael. And he leaned in and he said, ask him if we ever met in real life. I said, yes, he says you did. He said, ask him what he was wearing. He says he was dressed all in white. Ask him what he was carrying. He said he was carrying a Bible. 
ask him what we talked about. He says, you talked about life after death. And on and on like this. And when it was over, the, Michael had a message for him. He said, that was 100% correct. It was 20 years ago. I'm driving down the highway on a dark night. I'm falling asleep. I knew I should have pulled over, but I kept going. And here comes this figure in the dark off the side of the road, flagging me down. He's dressed all in white, carrying nothing but a Bible. He gets in the car and there was this look in his eyes that had, that had come up in the conversation, the look in his eye. And he said, where are you going? And the, the stranger said to him, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to this afterlife conference. So they ended up talking about the afterlife. And the, the driver says, where are you going? And, and he said, I'm going to Vegas. You know, carrying a Bible right in the middle of the dark. So he kept the, this my client awake. And then he said, I'll get out here now. And he just, it's the quintessential story of the person just disappearing. He looks in the rearview mirror. Why are you getting out here in the middle of nowhere? And there's nobody there. Saved him from running off the road. And for two decades, he'd wondered, was that real? And in he comes in this reading to tell the man exactly about that experience. To me, it was just one of the most stunning readings I'd ever done because it was so accurate. Now, here's the thing, though, Jeff. As a skeptic, I always try to, to listen to, see my readings from a skeptic's viewpoint. And anybody might say, oh, your client had that whole story in his mind. You're just picking up psychically all those details from his mind. But no, I felt Archangel Michael come in first, and I knew what he felt like from that previous visit where there was no other explanation with the Hebrews thing. So he was there first and every answer came right from him. That's an amazing story. Do you think that you will get to a point where you are not a skeptic anymore? Oh, I'm not a skeptic anymore. But I mean, of my own work, but I'm skeptical of other people's work because I know the level of uh, integrity it takes, not that other people don't have integrity, but we know there are some who don't, right? And then we, I also have been studying the brain, and I know that the left hemisphere's job is to take pieces of information and form stories, even if the story isn't true. And that to me is frightening because I don't want to make up a story that my left brain tells me is real and lead a client astray. That's why they have to give me verifiable information. And my client's validation is very important because we can run off and tell a story. And unless you feel that presence and know they're here, you wouldn't know you're telling a story. I've learned to tell spirit. If I can't feel your personality, capture your essence, I won't, I'll cut a reading off because I could be telling a story. That's why I'm skeptical of others until I find out if they are well-trained and know the difference between their imagination and an actual presence. The more we commit to the awakened way, will our life become more what some people consider to be miraculous? Yes, it's guaranteed. But it does not mean it will be painless because we absolutely learn from pain. And when people die, we grieve. When my loved ones in the future, if any of them die before I do, will I grieve even though I'm trying my best to live the awakened way and follow those principles? I hope so, because that's the result of loving so much. So we still have pain, but the suffering is so much less. And when you're not in only human thinking, then you're open to the miracles. And my definition, though, of a miracle is when the veil parts enough that you see the web in action. So it doesn't have to be walking on water. It can be as simple as being guided to open a magazine and see the word Eureka. You know, that to me is, that's the web. Would you say that in suffering less, when problems do arise, they'll just work themselves out? With less effort. Mm, oh, on a personal level, absolutely. Yeah. Can we change the world overnight? We have to help everybody else to live the awakened way. Yeah. But we still have to take effort, take action, make effort, uh, act on what guidance is coming through. 
be willing to follow through with what we sense. Oh, that's a moment by moment task. Yeah. Suzanne, you've been doing this work for many, many years. What inspires you to keep doing it? can barely contain the, the love that wells up in my heart when you ask that question. I've never known such a sense of connection with people as I did before. To love everybody, no matter what, is such a gift. I work with a team of assistants and my wonderful husband who all get it. And every time I get an email that says, your work has changed my life, I share it with them because I can't do it without them. I get emails regularly that say, you saved my life because people are in such a dark place, they want to leave the planet and we give them hope. I can't imagine a greater service than that. I get up, it's, my husband will tell you, it's an obsession for me. I like to say it's a driving purpose, but every thought is, how can I get a clearer connection? How can I make this better? How can I send more love out into the world? And I still have fun and, and get very human. And I still have moments when I um, say human things and uh, drop F-bombs. <laughs> well, you were but in they the don't military. Last very, <laughs> well, well, that's right. It's that Navy thing, right? But, uh, but it just so quickly comes back to balance. I, I like to teach people, we all have this inner dial and it's wonderful to find that perfect balance between human side and spirit side. Like this coin that I always have near, we designed it. The human side is the yin yang, all that opposites and duality and the, the heart in the center with the, with the spiral of growth is the, the soul side. We're both at once. But which side are you going to put it up? You know, you can only balance it so long. So we have human side, spirit side on a dial, like a fuel gauge, right? And so when I drop an F-bomb, I laugh and I say, human 100%. And then, boom, bring it right back to the center. When I'm meditating, I'm way over here to spirit side. So we can always, we go through our lives living the awakened way, gauging how am I seeing the world through the spirit lenses or the human lenses or both at the same time. And it just is such a beautiful way to live. Most of the world right now is pegged the human side and the drama because they don't realize there's this whole other aspect of themselves just waiting to be revealed. And your shows like yours help us do that. If I get back to your YouTube channel, you have a video about the seven steps in connecting across the veil. What is the most important step? It's the shift. And that's why the subtitle of my book is making the shift to a divinely guided life. Until you realize you're not only human and shift the dial, shift to an expanded state, shift to the soul's perspective, you're going to remain at this level. Einstein says, no challenge was ever solved at the level at which it originated. Where are all of our challenges? Here in this physical reality, we came here for the challenges, but it doesn't have to be that hard when you can shift. And it's not some metaphysical thing. It's an intention. It's pushing the channel and saying, there's a higher channel. Here I am. Would you say the best way to make that shift is changing your BS belief system? <laughs> <laughs> You've been me to my stuff. Yeah, your BS is your belief system. That's a great place to start. And they go, it goes hand in hand, belief and intention. Hold this very clear intention to make the shift and to change your BS. You're going to be one of the featured speakers at the Ascension Retreat in Sedona in 2024. What kind of juicy things are you going to be disclosing there? Oh, disclosing. That sounds like it's something I keep secret and I don't. I get it out there as much as I can. So I'm happy to share the awakened way of living, just like we've been talking, but with the tools and people will have a chance to have that experience and engage. So I'm going to do all three of the E's, right? Ex educate people about the greater reality with lots of stories. I've shared a couple here, but I, that's the most fun. That's of when I give presentations, I bring in the NOEs and 
give people tools that show, hey, I can do this too. Everybody can. And then engage higher consciousness, get message from loved ones who have passed. And I also will do something that for the first time, we're going to take a group out into the Red Rocks and have an experience, an adventure in consciousness, a meditation, a guided meditation among the rocks out in the vortexes, the vortices of Sedona, right? With that good energy. And my, my meditations are always guided by my guide, Sanaya. So we never know how it's going to go, but they just take us. That's pretty awesome. So they, not only can they listen to your speech, they get to go on a field trip with you. Yes. In fact, Jeff, I know that transmissions take place when I work with my guides. I led a cruise to Alaska last uh, August, August, my first one ever. And a healer friend of mine reached out to me. She said, Suzanne, I work with uh, several people who went on that cruise. I've worked with them regularly as a healer. And I didn't realize that four of them that I was working with had been on your cruise, but I noticed the same difference in all four of them. They seem to be embodying more of their higher self as if they received a transmission on that cruise. And that was so affirming to me. In fact, I'm leading another cruise next year because that one was so awesome for everybody to the Mediterranean. We just announced it, just announced it. I think we're on some kind of connection here because I was just going to say, I hope it's to Europe or something like that. There, see, mind meld going on here, field meld. Yeah, that's the Mediterranean Odyssey is September, 10 days. All that, all my events are right on my homepage if you just scroll down to featured events. Well, you're such a busy woman. <laughs> You've told us about so many things already. Is there anything yeah. else that you got going on that you want us to know about? Sure. I have a class with the Shift Network that's starting in December, an eight-week live webinar. So anybody anywhere can join that. I'm going to be teaching uh, mediumship the first two weekends in Savannah. The first one's for people that just want to connect to their own loved ones. They don't want to sit down and pair up and practice readings. The second weekend is an actual mediumship course where you, you get to sit with somebody and do readings for each other throughout the weekend. I did that for the first time thinking, oh, I can't do this. And Knock my own socks off. So I love that class because people are just stunned by, you mean I can do this too? So always classes, I've got the weekly podcasts that I do. We have a free Awakened Way app with those daily messages that I get from spirit. So yeah, it, it, it's busy, but so rewarding. If people have questions for you, should they leave them as comments in your YouTube videos? Oh, that... I, that's good, but we I don't see all of them. Um, what's the best way? We do Q and A sessions on the podcast. Yeah, that's a good place. We we do mine the my assistants mine mine the comments, and then every once in a while I do Q and A podcast. Let the spirit guides answer them, and we take them from those comments. So yeah, that's a good way to do it. Cool. Suzanne, before we wrap it up. Can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes, and it's something that I, I alluded to, but we, I didn't state it outright. And that is, we are never alone. I talked about how, you know, there are angels all around, but our loved ones who have passed are as close as our breath. They see us more often than when they were here. Angels and guides are real and they are around us. That big emptiness that we talked about that I had before was because I didn't realize this. I thought I had to do everything on my own. I thought I was alone. If I had only known how loved we are, I have this little mug here. You know, this is the phrase my guide send every daily message with. You are so very loved. And it's truth. The problem is we learn from other wounded humans to not love ourselves. And we believe those messages from people. And Nothing could be farther from the truth. So people hear my messages and they, 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 they react to them so positively because that's what we want to know. And I can guarantee you it is true. It's not wishful thinking. We are loved. We are beloved. We are love in full expression. There's an acronym to end this show with. <laughs> love in full expression. Life itself. Suzanne, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. 
total honor, Jeff. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.